understand see what has happened to us as southerners for so long we've been dumbed down uh, even with the since reconstruction with the with the advent of the, the building of the Freedmen's Bureau in 1865 uh, certainly the North knew that it had to come down here and propagandize the South so it sent its teachers here it dumbed our children down they did everything they could do to divide and separate black folks and white folks in the Southland of America The war was not over slavery. It was not an issue. Let me prove to you just by two simple statements. I'll give you more, but let me prove to you that the war was not fought over slavery. And therefore this flag could never ever have represented slavery. You see, Abraham Lincoln proposed a 13th Amendment to the Constitution. He proposed that 13th Amendment in March of 1861. Here was Abraham Lincoln's proposed 13th Amendment. Quote, no amendment shall be made to the Constitution which will authorize or give Congress the power to abolish or interfere within any state with the domestic institutions thereof, including that of persons held to labor or service by the laws of said state, end quote. Did you hear that? Lincoln's proposed 13th Amendment said Congress shall not have the power to interfere with any institutions within any state, including those held to labor or service by the laws of that state. In other words, what Abraham Lincoln was saying to the South, if you will accept this proposed 13th Amendment, you may forever keep slaves. Folks, Beauregard never fired on Fort Sumter until April the 9th. This was in March of 1861. If a war had been about slavery and if the South wanted just to keep slaves and that was it, why fire a gun? Why fire a shot? Just simply accept this proposed 13th Amendment and it would all be over. Let me read to you. This resolution was passed unanimously by Congress on July the 23rd, 1861. You may read it for yourself in the congressional record. Here's what this resolution says. The war is waged by the government of the United States, not in the spirit of conquest or subjection, nor for the purpose of overthrowing or interfering with the rights or institutions of the states, but to defend and protect the Union. Congress said, the war's not about slavery. Lincoln said, the war's not about slavery. I will even give you a 13th Amendment that will allow you to make slavery permanent. You see, what was happening was this. There's a lot of issues, and I can't cover them all tonight. But one of the issues was an economic issue. Do you realize the South, before the war, was extremely wealthy? And the South, before the war, funded probably 75 to 80 percent of all the taxes. But the, but the North wanted a 40 percent tariff. The South said no. The most we will ever agree to is a 10% tariff. And what Lincoln and the radical Republicans were doing was this. They were saying, we will give you the 13th Amendment. We will let you keep your slaves if that's what you want. You just let us keep our tariffs. In other words, the North was willing to sell the blacks out for money, for higher taxes. They weren't interested in the slaves. They could care less. You see, Hapgood's book, Abraham Lincoln, The Man of the People, on page 273, quotes Abraham Lincoln as saying, if I could save the Union without freeing any of the slaves, I would do it. Abraham Lincoln later said that slaves are property, and if freed, they should be paid for. 
Later on, Lincoln said, I have no purpose directly or indirectly to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. I believe I have no lawful right to do so, and I have no inclination to do so. Now here Lincoln is acknowledging that he has no lawful right to interfere with slavery. Slavery, by the way, was constitutional. All 13 colonies agreed on it. And by the way, in 1776, all 13 colonies held slaves. Not just the South, all of them. Lincoln said, I have no lawful right to interfere, nor, he says, do I have an inclination to do so. In a letter to Alexander Stevens, who happened to be later the vice president of the Confederacy, Lincoln wrote Alexander Hamilton Stevens and says this, Do the people of the South really entertain fear that a Republican administration would directly or indirectly interfere with their slaves, or with them about their slaves? If they do, I wish to assure you that once as a friend, and still I hope not an enemy, that there is no cause for such fears. The South would be in no more danger in this respect than it was in the days of Washington. So once again, Lincoln is saying, it's not over slavery. You say, but Brother Weaver, Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. And the Emancipation Proclamation freed the slaves. No, it didn't. The Emancipation Proclamation did not free one slave. Do you know what Abraham Lincoln tried to do with the Emancipation Proclamation? In fact, he says so himself, and so does other men in his cabinet. They say that the Emancipation Proclamation was a war measure. Lincoln, number one, wanted to keep England specifically and the rest of Europe particularly from joining in with or recognizing the Confederate States of America. That was his first goal in that Emancipation Proclamation. His second goal was a war measure, another war measure, in the sense he was hoping that the blacks in the South would rise up in rebellion against their white masters and their white people. Let me tell you something. Just to show you there was no trouble in the South, there was not one rebellion during that war of black folks. Do you realize a thousand torches in a thousand black hands would have emptied the Confederate armies because the men would have gone home to protect their families. And Lincoln knew that. You see, what Lincoln did was this. Now listen to me. Lincoln tried to free the slaves in the South where he had absolutely no authority and he refused to release the slaves in the North where he did have authority. Did you know that in the Northern armies, even when they were fighting the South, there were slaveholders in the Northern armies? Did you know that General Robert E. Lee, when he inherited some slaves, freed them? General Ulysses S. Grant, who was the main general of the North and afterwards became president, even after the war was over, he kept his slaves. And he did so with this excuse. Good help is hard to find. You see, the truth of the matter is this. The Emancipation Proclamation was not only unconstitutional, and everybody recognized it. It cost the Republicans a lot of elections. There were five northern states that refused after that to elect Republicans to Congress. And moreover, there were a lot of Union soldiers that deserted because of it and refused to fight. Slavery was not the issue. We, we always talk about how we think these babies are losing their manners and they're losing their southernness. But I'm going to tell you something. There's a resolve in those children, much like their grandfathers that, that, that we see buried around here. Uh, they want to know. And now they have these things called computers. These babies start pl plucking in these things and these teachers can't get away with that stuff they used to get away with uh, about, you know, our ancestors were demonic. Uh, slavery. When these children get the truth, they're going to demand that whoever's sitting in that White House Get right on up and go right on down to the treasury and return some of that stealing that took place around here. I'll tell you about that. Not only are they going to demand that, he, that they bring back some of the stealing that took place around here in the South Bend of America, these babies are going to demand that somebody that walks down there to that education department, that United States Department of Education, that they tell the real truth and restore the honor of our Southern family down here. All right, I'm in uh, archive.org and I found uh, these images here that were uh, uploaded 
by Herbert Booker, it says here, Black Confederates who serve in the U.S. Civil War. And it says here, this is not meant to glorify the Confederate States of America, but African Americans, right, so-called African Americans, served on both sides uh, in the U.S. Civil War, believe it or not. Not only um, people of color or so-called Black Americans, but Native American Indians also served in the Confederate and Union armies or indigenous people, right? And navies. Here are photographs taken during the years 1861 to 1865 and up to 1923, possibly to 1940.
All right. I uh, just want to read from uh, this book. It's called Black Confederates and Afro Jankies in Civil War, Virginia. Irvin L. Jordan, Jr. Again, Black Confederates and Afro Jankies in Civil War, Virginia. And uh, just real quick, we go all the way to Chapter 10 just to, uh, you know, go through the information that correlates here. It says here, Salads of the Wrong Afro-Confederate Loyalism. All right, so dodge the hijack with the Afro. They just mean people of dark complexion or Black Confederates. Um, people of color from Virginia or Black Virginians volunteered and supported the Confederacy. Volunteered, all right? Now, because we have a whole chapter in this book talking about the uh, body servants. Now, they try to say that the only black confederates you'll ever find is body servants. And that's not true. And if and there was so-called black body servants, but there was also white body servants. It's whoever had an indentured servant and brought him along with them. And that master wasn't always a white person. There was actually, again, so-called black slave masters. Right. And they brought their own indentured servants too as body servants as well but we also as we see in this chapter have the case where people again we got this in the last chapter in louisiana right people were volunteering wealthy prominent families as you can see here another example in virginia same thing was happening they volunteered and supported the confederacy at the onset of the war even though they had been treated as inferiors and lived in a state of fear one motivation was the possible improvement in their everyday status and a relaxation of some of the political and legal restraints against them by identifying and actively supporting the Confederate cause, they anticipated white post-war gratitude in the form of increased privileges and rights, all right? But maybe they was just fighting for their land and their right to be uh, plantation owners and have indentures and, and just keep their ways, right? Several free blacks in Virginia were slave and property owners, all right? Again, what? Several free black Virginians, people of color, were what? Slave and property owners, slave owners who deemed their way of life threatened by the northern invasion and yearned to prove to their white neighbors that they too were southern patriots all right those publicly loyal to the confederacy were pragmatically acknowledging who and where they were their determination to stand with the south was akin to free men consciously performing a civic duty all right it's just their civic duty black confederate loyalty was more widespread than american history has acknowledged all right they kept this out of history. In May 1861, Culpeper Courthouse residents R.L. Patterson observed several black Virginians attached to Confederate military companies passing through the town. One male slave stirred to Southern patriotism, fervently vowed, if old Lincoln does put his foot on old Fergurney, I can raise a regiment of uh, the N-word the Negroes here understand all about it. The people have informed them as to the true state of things. They could know that the South are their real friends. By the summer of 1861, Confederates or, you know, Black Confederates, Southern Blacks who supported and allied themselves with the Confederacy, sought to volunteer. But the Confederate War Department at first declined numerous offers to enlist them. However, when a Union regiment at First Ohio Volunteers was attacked, on 17 of June 1861 near Vienna, as it traveled by train to Falls Church, Church, the Confederate attack was led by the 1st South Carolina Infantry, accompanied by a body of 150 armed uh, picnic Negroes, all right, people of color who were in the Confederate side, 150 of them, a whole regiment, six slaves who escaped from Matthews County in July 1861 to the safety of the USS Mount Vernon said that when the county's whites attempted to arm blacks they deserted in every direction during that same month thomas a phelps a slave wrote to his mother of the pride he felt in being a soldier in the confederate army all right so he was so um proud to be in the confederate army huh i will leave today for a scout about the woods for the jankies give my love to mistress and master yes goodbye to the white folks until i kill a janky <laughs> that's what he's saying i guess there were several unaccounted and unheralded uh black virginians who could and did pose as white and served in state regiments posed as white i have a great deal of faith in the south I have a great deal of faith in our young generation even though we say that they don't say yes sir no ma'am and they've not talked to say the lord's prayer but i'm gonna tell you something there's a resolve in southern people young and old 
there will come a day that that worm will turn and the truth will be known here in the South Land of America about what happened. That rule, because you know, I don't know why some black folks think the Northern folks have this great love for them. Those Northern folks know history. They know about all those black folks who ran with, with, with white folks around here and fought and died and sniped and killed Yankees. They don't have no love. There's no love for them around here. So the only way basically that we could do this thing is to dumb down the people and grab black folks and divide and separate them down in the South. We can't have those black folks around there uh, 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 voting uh, with those with this Southern white family. What was the sense of going to war if we did that? So, and orchestrated, and this was this was a great program. People think this is a mistake, or it's just something accidentally happened. This is an ongoing uh, uh, Cold War that was instituted by these folks in the North to divide and separate us. All you have to do is say the word slavery, and, and, and it's been a, a situation where Christian white folks have, in the South have held their heads down because the whole institution of slavery has been blamed solely on, on, on Christian white folks in the South and the whole world act as though it didn't participate and the whole world did participate. And the whole world did participate. All right, and we uh, continue in this book. Uh, slavery was not the cause of the war between the states, the irrefutable argument by Gene Kaiser Jr. We're in chapter two of this book. It says here, the North did not go to war to end slavery. If they had, they would have started by passing a Constitution Amendment abolishing slavery. They did the opposite. They overwhelm, overwhelmingly passed the Corwin Amendment, which left Black people in slavery forever, even beyond the reach of Congress. This alone proves unequivocally that the North did not go to war to end slavery or free the slaves. The North does not get to redefine in the middle of the war its reason for going to war. What the North proclaimed in the beginning stands as its reason for going to war, and it is unchangeable. War measures halfway through the war, such as the Emancipation Proclamation that freed no slaves and prevented close to a million slaves from achieving their freedom, have nothing to do with why the North went to war in the first place. A near unanimous resolution entitled the War Aims Resolutions established early on what the North was fighting for. It was passed by the Northern Congress in July 1861, three months after the bombardment of Fort Sumter. That this war is not waged upon our part in any spirit of oppression, nor for any purpose of conquest or subjugation, nor for the purpose of overthrowing or interfering with the rights or institutions of the states, but to defend and maintain the supremacy of the Constitution, which allowed and protected slavery and to preserve the union to preserve the union throughout the antebellum years as the country achieved its manifest destiny all right manifest destiny we know what that means marching westward winning the mexican war growing in wealth and power all right they remember they were uh you know colonizing taking the land the indigenous land in their manifest destiny growing in wealth and power right no credible northern leaders said they should march armies into the south to end slavery Throughout the first two years of the war, almost nobody in the North said they were fighting to end slavery. To do so would risk racist Union soldiers deserting because they signed up to fight for the Union, not to free slaves whom they feared would move North and inundate their towns and cities and be job competition, all right? So that makes logical sense. They ain't fighting to free people that are basically then going to end up trying to steal their jobs. Julia then Grant, wife of Ulysses S. Grant, might have freed her four slaves if she had thought it was uh, an abolition war and not a war for the Union, right? So even these Northern Unionists had slaves. Most Northerners, excluding few truly good-hearted abolitionists, accepted slavery. As stated earlier, historians Lee Benson and Gavin Wright maintained that the percentage of abolitionists in the North was probably no more than 2%, almost certainly no more than 5% of the Northern electorate. And ironically, Many of them didn't like slavery because they didn't like blacks and did not want to associate with them. Prominent abolitionist Elijah Lovejoy had been murdered by an outrage northern mob in Lincoln's own Illinois in 1837. All right, these people, abolitionists, right? Elijah, hmm, that sounds like a Hebrew name to me or maybe possibly Sephardic Jewish Lovejoy, huh? Elijah Lovejoy. He's being lynched 
right? He got murdered by a, a mob in Lincoln's own Illinois. Remember Lincoln and my Lincoln video, he, he was saying how it's dangerous for him to go back to his hometown. He might get hung or lynched. Why was he saying that? The mob was trying to destroy Lovejoy's abolitionist materials in his press. By 1861, Northerners had been supporting slavery for 241 years and would continue supporting it through the war between the states since five slave states, as noted earlier, fought for the North. Again, those states are Maryland, Delaware, Kentucky, Missouri, and West Virginia, which came into the Union during the war as slave states, right? So these Southern states who joined the Union had their own slaves. And again, if logically, if, if they were really about ending slavery, they would have made them, you know, get rid of their slaves first, right? If the North was fighting to end slavery, it would never permit slave states to fight for the Union, or it would have ended slavery in the Union states immediately. It did the opposite and made sure by constitutional amendment and proclamation that slavery in the Union was protected just as it was and had always been by the Constitution. That's how the North really felt about slavery and freeing the slaves. Lincoln himself took it a step further. He supported the first 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, the Corwin Amendment, which would have left black people in slavery forever and even beyond the reach of Congress. It passed March 2nd, 1861, two days before Lincoln's first inaugural. It reads, No amendment shall be made to the Constitution which will authorize or give to Congress the power to abolish or interfere within any state with a domestic institution thereof slavery, including that of persons held to labor, slaves, or service by the laws of the state. About the Corwin Amendment, Lincoln said in his first inaugural on March 4, 1861, I understand a proposed amendment to the Constitution, which amendment, however, I have not seen, has passed Congress to the effect that the federal government shall never interfere with the domestic institutions of the state, including that of persons held to service. To avoid misconstruction of what I have said, I depart from my purpose not to speak of particular amendments so far as to say that holding such a provision to now be implied constitutional law. I have no objection to its being made express and irrevocable. So there's Lincoln himself letting you know he don't really care about people who are held in service. It's not really about that. It says before Lincoln took office, President uh, James Buchanan actually signed the Corwin Amendment after it had been approved by Congress and was ready to be sent to the states for ratification. Buchanan's act was symbolic only. It is important to note that the Corwin Amendment had required a two-third vote in the House and Senate, and it had passed with mostly Northern votes because seven Southern states were out of the Union by then and did not vote. Indeed, the bill's sponsor, Representative Thomas Corwin, was from Ohio. Three Northern states ratified the Corwin Amendment, Ohio, Maryland, and Illinois, before the war made it moot. After the Corwin Amendment passage, Lincoln sent a letter with a copy of the Corwin Amendment to each state's governor pointing out that Buchanan had signed it. Lincoln was making sure everyone knew of his strong support of slavery forever, even beyond the reach of Congress. Before even mentioning the Corwin Amendment, in his first inaugural, Lincoln made it clear that he strongly supported slavery and had no inclination to end it. Apprehension seems to exist among the people of the southern states that by the accession of a Republican administration, their property and their peace and personal security are to be endangered. There has never been any reasonable cause for such apprehension. Indeed, the most ample evidence to the contrary has all the while existed and been open to their inspection. It is found in nearly all the published speeches of him who now addresses you. I do but quote, from one of those speeches when I declare that I have no purpose directly or indirectly to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it is exists. I believe I have no lawful right to do so, and I have no inclination to do so. Those who nominated and elected me 
did so with full knowledge that I have made this and many similar declarations and had never recanted them. And more than this, they placed in the platform for my acceptance and as law to themselves and to me the clear and emphatic resolution which I now read. Resolved that the maintenance inviolate of the rights of the states and especially the right of each state in order and control its own domestic institutions according to its own judgment exclusively as essential to that balance of power of which the perfection and endurance of our political fabric depend and we denounce the lawless invasion by armed forces of the soil of any state or territory no matter under what pretext as among the gravest of crimes. I now reiterate these sentiments, and in doing so, I only press upon the public attention the most conclusive evidence of which the case is susceptible, that the property, peace, and security of no section are to be in any wise endangered by the now incoming administration. All right, so that was basically Lincoln, you know, letting you know, hey, you guys know, I was always letting you know, you know, that was always my you know, campaign. I wasn't going to, you know, focus or, or, or get rid of, you know, the, the people who are held in servitude or so-called slavery, right, as they're calling it here. So he's clearly, it wasn't really about freeing people, right? And remember, what is the biggest detail about Lincoln, right? Let's not forget, Lincoln was swarthy, a so-called Negro so-called black man, dark-skinned man. He's uh, describes himself like that, you know, many times. We have read the books, the primary sources, all right? Check out the full video. Um, and we're going to continue. It says here, on August 22nd, 1862, 16 months into the war, Lincoln wrote uh, to Horace Greeley, editor of the New York Tribune, in response to a letter Greeley had sent him and reiterated, My paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union, and it's not either to save or to destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. What I do about slavery and the colored race, I do because I believe it helps to save the Union. And what I forbear, I forbear because I do not believe it would help the Union. All right, so letting you know, Lincoln, right? He's also colored and he's letting you know what I do for any colored person. It's not because, you know, he's colored like me, but because I do it because I believe it helps the Union. Anything that helps the Union, if that involves helping colored people, if that involves helping so-called white people, he's going to do it. It wasn't about complexion. It was all about the Union. Exactly one month, September 22nd, 1862, after writing his letter to Horace Greeley, Lincoln issued the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation and the very first paragraph states clearly that the war is being fought to restore the Union and not to free the slaves. I, Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States of America, and Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy thereof do hereby proclaim and declare that hereafter, as heretofore, the war will be prosecuted for the object of practically restoring the constitutional relation between the United States and each of the states, and the people thereof in which states that relation is or may be suspended or disturbed. Daniel says, clearly the North did not instigate a war to end slavery. The focus on slavery as the primary cause of the war between the states, even indirectly, is a fraud of biblical proportions, and it prevents real understanding of American history. Pulitzer Prize winning historian and Lincoln scholar David H. Donald, back in the 1960s, was concerned about the overemphasis of slavery as the cause of the war. He said the civil rights movement seems to have been the reason for stressing slavery as the cause 
of the war. Ooh, big one. So he's saying this whole thing about when the people started saying that civil right, you know, the civil war had to do be, you know, with ending slavery was during the civil rights movement in the 1960s. Before then, people knew what it was about and really people what they were really fighting for. I mean, people who were actually in the war, right? But it all started in the civil rights movement, huh? A lot of things started during these civil rights, right? I have already proven that the North did not go to war to end slavery, all right? Case closed. We've already proven that so many ways. Like, I mean, so-called Lincoln is a colored man, all right? Come on. But now we know, you know, it's all about the union. It wasn't really about any of that. It's protecting their interests, the businesses and everything of the union, the North, right? There is much more evidence, but the following is a good summary of the things in the beginning that show beyond the shadow of a doubt that the North did not go to war to free the slaves or because of slavery. It says here, number one, the North's war aims resolution, which states clearly that they are fighting to preserve the Union and not for the purpose of overthrowing or interfering with the rights or institutions of slavery of the states or, the, or indentured servitude. Lincoln's constant promises and high-profile forums, such as his first inaugural address, to protect slavery where it existed. The United States Congress overwhelmingly passage. All right, so that was number two. This is number three. The United States Congress overwhelming passage of the Corwin Amendment, which would have left black people in slavery forever, even beyond the reach of Congress. If the North was fighting to end slavery, it would have passed a constitutional amendment ending slavery and not one that guarded, guaranteed the black people would be in slavery forever, even beyond the reach of Congress. Three northern states ratified the Corwin Amendment, including Lincoln's own Illinois, before the war made its moot. This alone proves unequivocally that the North did not go to war to free the slaves or to end slavery, emphasis added. All right, point number four, Lincoln's strong support for the Corwin Amendment, as stated in his first inaugural and in personal letters to the governors. Number five, the North's historical support for slavery and slave trading. All right, number six, the fact that when Lincoln sent his hostile military mission to Charleston to start the war, just prior to the bombardment of Fort Sumter, there were more slave states in the Union than in the Confederacy. There was more slave states in the Union. Listen, man, that's some complete hijack of history. Like, wow, total flip. Like, come on, man. Hypocrite. Like, really? Like, come on. There was more slave states in the union than in the confederacy when they went to bombard charleston man come on northern leaders no credible northern leader throughout the antebellum this is point number seven period said that they out to march armies into the south to free slaves nobody ever said that there's no quotes of anybody primary sources indeed abolitionists were hated in the north elijah lovejoy was murdered in lincoln's illinois they didn't really like these people up there point number eight northerner leaders almost none of whom for the first two years of the war said that they were fighting to free the slaves ulysses s grant's wife julia owned four slaves all right they had slaves they were in the union it would be hard for grant to say he had gone to war to end slavery when his own house was a slave holding household all right the number point number nine the five slave states that fought for the north throughout the war Maryland, Delaware, Missouri, Kentucky, and West Virginia. They were slave states, all right? Point number 10, the preliminary emancipation proclamation is issued September 22nd, 1862. That states clearly in the very first paragraph that hereafter, as theretofore, the war will be prosecuted for the object of practically restoring the constitutional relation between the U.S. and seceded states, example, the Union. There's no mention of slavery. There's no reason, right? There's no reason stated there that says that they went to war or they're going to war to free the slaves or to end slavery, okay? Point number 11, the Emancipation Proclamation that freed no slaves or few and deliberately left at least 832,259 uh, who were under Northern control and slavery. Most of those black people officially stay, stayed slaves until well after the end of war. They could have been freed easily if the North had wanted to free them. 
The Emancipation Proclamation states literally that it is a war measure and it was not issued early on. All right. It was not issued before Lincoln took office or after the bombardment of Fort Sumter or during Lincoln's first inaugural. It was issued two years into the war and it freed no slaves or few. The conditions around the issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation and its timetable established the fact that the North most certainly did not go to war on April 12, 1861 to end slavery or free the slaves. The North's support for slavery goes back to the beginning of the country when Northern and British slave traders brought most of the slaves here and made huge fortunes in the process. Dr. Edgar J. McManus, in his excellent book, Black Bondage in the North, writes that Boston merchants, all right, these Boston merchants, right, 1600s, who's the merchants? Remember, let's not, let's not go back, backwards, right? Who's these merchants? Most of these are Sephardic and Moorish people, these merchants, Protestant merchants, Dutch, Huguenots, all right? So the, again, it says in the book, Black Bondage in the North, all right, he writes, Mr. Edgar McManus, that the Boston merchants entered the African trade as early as 1644, dodged the hijack. They weren't getting Africans. We already know who they were helping come over here in their ships. And by 1676, they were bringing back cargoes as far away as East Africa. All right. So we got to prove that because we know they were going all the way. Yeah, they went over there, but they had nothing to do with bringing slaves. And if they did, they brought them somewhere else. You got to show me that these are people from Madagascar they were bringing. Show me the proof. All right. Because we know. We know, right, based on my indentured servitude videos and who these ships were really bringing, you know, helping people flee, uh, religious persecution, and indentured servitude, bringing them over, making so much money off that, kidnapping people over there, spiriting them away. We already know the story, right? Virtually the entire infrastructure of the Old North was built on profits from slave trade and slave traders, such as Boston's Peter Faneuil or Faneuil Hall. Peter Faneuil, remember, all right, ladies and gentlemen, Peter Faneuil, the Faneuils were Huguenots. He was a Huguenot. A Huguenot is a Moor. Huguenot Moor. Moor. He's Moor. This guy, so-called black man, Peter Faneuil. Faneuil was a Moor. Huguenot. Huguenot. Yeah, and he was what? One of the slave traders, right? Biggest ones to profit from slave trade. Peter Hall, Huguenot Moor. And North in the North, yes, they did a total flip on us, right? Break the spell, my people. Break the spell. It says, ironically named Cradle of Liberty, right? Fanny Hall, the Cradle of Liberty, right? Where they actually sold mad people, indentured servants. It's right on the shore. I've been there. I'm from Boston. I know right where it's at, Fanny Hall. And I never knew it would be, I never imagined it was built by a moor or named after a moor. Fanny Hall, right? And I continue, which might have been a cradle for him, but sure wasn't for the tens of thousands of of colored or indentured servants, uh, you know, he was responsible for snatching from their families and forcing into the horrors of the Middle Passage, forcing people who was getting spirit. Remember, we read about also the Sephardic Jewish people being taken out of Spain and all these places and uh, all these uh, people being spirited away from England and Ireland and all these uh, indentured servants. Right. We got the whole history and we got the ships. We got the whole primary sources of this happening. All right. Show me that happening in Africa. Show me when Peter Faneuil went to Africa. There is no proof of Peter Faneuil going to Africa, snatching anybody. That's that's most likely a very lie. That's a lie right there. And there's no source for that, as you can see. <laughs> so here all Americans, but especially African-Americans, deserve to know the entire truth about slavery and not some whitewashed version. There we go. Well, you're doing the same thing, Mr. Arthur, by saying everybody came from Africa. That's a whitewashed version. That's false Pan-African narrative, right? Let's talk about truth. As you quoted here, quotes, truth is why Lerone Bennett, Bennett, Sephardic Jewish name, Bennett for Baruch or blessed Baruch Bennett, all right, wrote Force into Glory to reveal that racist Abraham Lincoln deliberately did not free any slaves or freed very few with the Emancipation Proclamation. In most of Lincoln's life, Lerone Bennett says all of his life supported sending African Americans back to Africa or into a climate suitable to them. All right. So I think he's talking about the American Colonization Society. And actually, he was sending people to Panama. I believe there was a colony Lincoln tried to set up over there. So yeah, they're talking, they're right about that. But these so called African Americans, you know, they had a lot of them weren't even African or ever been nothing related to Africa. 
All right, so real quick, just wanted to show an example of what we were talking about. Uh, so I got this uh, town or colony that happened or didn't happen. It says Lincolnia, right? Lincolnia was the name of a proposed Central American colony suggested by Republican United States Senator Samuel Pomeroy of Kansas in 1862 after U.S. President Abraham Lincoln asked the Senator and the United States Secretary of the Interior, Kelly Smith, to work on a plan to resettle uh, people of color from the United States. Since his early political career, Abraham Lincoln supported the American Colonization Society. All right. So even Lincoln was like, Garvey, you know, go back to, you know, Africa or, you know, they were, he was trying to move people of color away. Why? You know, a lot of these were Indian, indigenous people that were they even called co people of color. A lot of these were Huguenots, Sephardic Jews, indentured servants. But yeah, but uh, the main point is, yeah, he was actually trying to do that as the uh, last book we were reading just said and stated. It says a controversial group whose goal was the removal of free blacks from the United States. The removal of free black removal. Abraham Lincoln was down with that. Removal of free blacks. And his state affiliates starting in the 1820s began settlements in West Africa that would eventually unite, unite to form Liberia. All right. That's a future video we got. We're going to get all the evidence and all this history there, what happened, uh, how Liberia all got started, right? Similarly to Lincolnia, the name of Liberia's capital, Monrovia, was derived from the name of the fifth president of the United States, James Monroe. All right. It says Lincoln's desire to return former slaves to Africa or other tropical regions with their consent and the accord of the authorities of the country where they were to be settled. He repeated his support for colonization numerous times, including during the American Civil War. Now look at this. Listen to where he was going to put these people. It says by 1862, Lincoln had decided that Chiriqui province, Chiriqui, Chiriqui. Why does that sound like Cherokee or Cherokee, the Ch Chikori, Chiriqui, Chiriqui, Cherokee, Chiriqui, the Chiriqui, Chiriqui province. Which happens to be a very indigenous area, always. At the time, part of the Granadine Confederation, but today in Panama, would be an ideal location to start a colony where blacks, especially freedmen, could lead better lives than they could in the United States. In August of that year, he invited a group of prominent colored people to the White House to discuss the plan. He stated that the area had evidence of very rich coal mines among the finest harbors in the world. So-called African-Americans, including Frederick Douglass, were in general firmly opposed to immigration. No, 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 you're gonna find our bones here, Frederick Douglass said. He's here, man, the bones, you'll find them here. Frederick Douglass, right? And the delegation unsurprisingly reacted negatively. Later that month, the Natural Republic published an editorial with the title, The Colony of Lincolnia, which stated that the necessary arrangements for founding a colony on a grand scale have been completed um here's a whole uh book on this it's called the colonization after emancipation lincoln and the movement of black resettlement all right that's the hijack with the whitewash images all right colonization it says chapter one here the curious politics of colonization without being an enthusiast lincoln was firm believer in colonization this was the assessment given to him by presidential secretaries john nicole and John Hay in a duly celebrated 1890 biography of their late employer. The colonization of freed slaves to either Africa or the tropics of Central America and the Caribbean featured prominent in Abraham Lincoln's formative belief on race and slavery, enabled by 600 thousand appropriation from congress lincoln's aggressively pursued the policy in the early part of his presidency all right he was trying to get what remove free blacks as they were saying removal of free blacks lincoln was by no means the first president to advocate colonization the idea dated to the revolutionary period when many of the nation's founding fathers grappled with the troublesome place of slavery in a count ostensibly founded on the concept of natural equality as expressed in the Declaration of Independence. All right, so just wanted to go ahead and I just real quick come into this. We're going to go back to the book we were just uh, basically at. So all this life, I guess, as Bennett was saying, uh, all most of Lincoln's life, uh, Abraham Lincoln says, supported sending, uh, you know, 
black Americans, so-called black Americans, uh, back to Africa or into a climate suitable to them. The preliminary emancipation proclamation confirms this long-held belief of Lincoln's state, Lincoln's that the effort to colonize persons of, uh, you know, uh, so-called black descent or, you know, they're saying African because they mean, you know, they're trying to add the hijack with their consent upon this continent or elsewhere with the previously obtained consent of the government existing there will be continued. There would have been no American slavery without black tribal chieftains in Africa and British and Yankee slave trades, right? So dodge the hijack big time, as you can see. A lot of that didn't have quotes. <laughs> We're about to see quotes now. We got footnotes. See these little footnotes. Let's see what he says here. It says the reason the South gets all the blame is because of half a century of political correctness in which only one side of the story has been told. Because if you tell the Southern side, even in a scholarly manner, you open yourself up to charges of being a racist, a member of the KKK who wishes uh, we still had slavery, right? So that's kind of true that people kind of like, yo, what are you talking about, Cootie Mail? Like, come on, man. Come on, there was slaves, man. Come on, man. We are from slaves. I'm like, whoa, come on, dude. Don't speak for everybody, you know? You know, it's not true. Every time, A lot of people were, were always free. A lot of people were always free. It says esteemed historian Eugene D. Uh, Genovese writes to speak positively about any part of this southern tradition is to invite charges of being a racist and an apologist for slavery and segregation. We are witnessing a cultural and political atrocity, atrocity, an increasingly successful campaign by the media and an academic elite to strip young white southerners and arguably uh, black southerners as well of their heritage, all right, black southerners of their heritage and therefore their identity. They are being taught to forget their forebears or to remember them with shame. NAACP resolutions passed in 1987 and 1991 spewing hatred on the Confederate battle flag also intimidate scholars who would rather not weigh in or who will take the anti-self side without a fair examination of the issues. Professors know that they stand almost no uh, chance of getting tenure if they say anything good about the South in the war between states. They know that we live in a shallow and superficial time and just as accusatory whiff in the air that someone is a racist, whether they are not, are or not, will end a college history career or prevent one from getting started. All right. But remember the old proverb. The one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. The war between the states is a central event in American history. It should be examined thoroughly, just as Lerone Bennett has examined Abraham Lincoln and given us a fresh perspective on old home, honest Abe. The races who use the N word more than the grand wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, all right? The same Abe, all right? They're saying Abe used the N-word more than the dude in charge of the KKK. Lincoln, who wanted to ship black people back to Africa and who deliberately freed no slaves with the Emancipation Proclamation when he could have freed close to a million under Union control. There is a lot to know and think about in order to understand what really happened. All right. So that was uh, chapter two of this book. We're going to continue next time on chapter three, all right? And uh, you can't have a discussion about history's heroes without casting a skeptical eye. And helping us do that is a man who sees 2020 when it comes to presidents who receive more credit than they're due. Judge Andrew Napolitano joins us. He's the author of Theodore and Woodrow, How Two American Presidents Destroyed Constitutional Freedoms. I have it right here on the desk. Look at that. The hard copy. Beautiful. Oh, very kind. Thank you, Kennedy. All right. Well, uh, welcome back, Judge. Pleasure. Pleasure to be here. So I, I want to talk about Theodore and Woodrow. But first, I think because we're on the, the precipice of President's Day, right. we need to talk about the man who inspires so much fawning, Abraham Lincoln. He's the guy who freed the slaves. He started the Republican Party. And he's a lot of people's favorite president of all time. Save the Union. He saved the Union, Camille. Yeah. Are they wrong? I, I am a contrarian on Abraham Lincoln, and I bemoan the fact that he's been mythologized since the progressive era, since the era of Theodore uh, Roosevelt and uh, Woodrow Wilson, and particularly by the public school establishment in the United States, which almost 
would have you believe he's the fourth member of, of the Blessed Trinity. Uh, I prefer to look at Lincoln this way. At the time that he was the president of the United States, slavery was dying a, a natural death all over the Western world. It had just been expired by legislation in England. It has just died a natural death. That is, it was no longer economically feasible in Puerto Rico and Brazil. And the Southern plantation owners were on the cusp of it dying here. Instead of allowing it to die or helping it to die, or even purchasing the slaves and then freeing them, which would have cost a lot less money than the Civil War cost, Lincoln set about on the most murderous war in American history, in which over 750,000 soldiers and civilians, all Americans, died. Now, that's more uh, people killed as a result of American military action in one war than in all wars combined. That, of course, spawned Jim Crow. That, of course, spawned the Ku Klux Klan. That, of course, spawned the need for a Martin Luther King, which was a, a, a good end result from this. But the so-called freedom that Lincoln thought he was he was bringing wouldn't come about for another 125 years because of its its birth in violence rather than in its birth in government violence rather than its birth in the natural progress of human freedom. Poor Abraham Lincoln locked up over 3,000 people in the North who didn't take up arms against the government, but who spoke out against it and who wrote against it and who published their writings. He had utter and total and complete disregard I mean, uh, for the Constitution. Habeas corpus yeah, and, 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 even and as a result of that, mm -hmm. his successors have used his behavior as examples of what presidents can do in wartime, another reason they like war, because they can disregard those nasty things called civil liberties.